Okay, uh, so good evening everyone. Um, so as Sue said, I'm, I'm David, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I want to start with a little uh, demonstration. I'll explain later on what that has to do with what I'm talking about. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, many of you have probably done this before, so it's not that new. Please cross your middle and index finger, put them to the bridge of your nose, close your eyes, and move the fingers up and down. Uh, the weird sensation that uh, arises when you do this is known as the two noses illusion. How many of you feel uh, that you have two noses when you do this, or at least that it's a bit weird, slightly weird sense of touch? Okay, so what's, what's going on? Uh, why, why do we, why does doing this feel so strange? Well, um, if we look at what goes on in your brain uh, when you uh, feel a sensation of touch, uh, in, in our brains we, we have uh, a specific brain area known as somatosensory cortex, which uh, is the area that becomes active when we feel a touch sensation. So this is a slice through the brain, it's kind of parallel to uh, the plane of the face. Uh, this is one side of the brain. And we can see which parts of the cortex, the outer layer of the brain, represent different parts of the body. Um, and, and as you can see, there's, bit, there's, there's a logic to it. Things that are close to each other in the body are close to each other on the brain's surface as well. Now if we zoom in on the area that represents the hand, we see that um, the different fingers are represented next to each other. So normally, if you were to touch your nose with just two fingers, um, you would feel a touch sensation on areas that are close to each other in the brain. But when you cross your fingers, uh, you'll, you'll feel the touch on two locations that are far from each other in space and far from each other in the brain. Which is why your brain's best interpretation of what's going on is, I must be touching two separate things. Now, the reason I wanted to start with this demonstration is to talk about the fact that we don't experience reality. What we experience consciously at any given point in time is our brain's best guess, our best estimate of what might be generating the sensations that we get through our senses. Um, and and it, this, this is maybe a good uh, a point to talk about the fact that this is, is not a new idea. So Plato already talked about um, what he called the, uh, uh, the allegory of the cave. And he said, imagine uh, that uh, there's a group of prisoners who are sitting in a cave and they're tied to chairs so they can only look in one direction. And behind them is a fire and uh, puppeteers hold up various objects so that all the prisoners ever see is shadows on the wall and that's all they know of the world. And Plato's point was, all we see all the time are the shadows that our senses allow us to see. They are what our brains, well he didn't call it brains back then because back then they didn't know it was a brain doing this, but what we experience of the world around us is the sense that we make of the incoming information. Uh, see, the, if, if you know how the senses make, uh, work, you can create sensations that seem to make sense, even though uh, the physical events that lead to them don't necessarily have that original sense in them. So up till now, I've been talking about um, stationary events, uh, uh, things that happen at a particular point in time. What's that got to do with storytelling? Well, most of the events we perceive in the world um, have to do with events that unfold in time. And as we move through life, we try to make sense of those as well. And what we're doing at any given time, in a very real way, is telling ourselves a story about what's going on. And when we tell ourselves a story, we, we, we introduce certain elements into the way that we interpret them. For example, we, we edit um, what we see. One way we do this is by blinking. So there's research that shows, for example, that our blinking is not random. It doesn't just happen when we need to moisten our eyes. It's our own internal editing system. So for example, if you give people a, a clip um, of uh, Mr. Bean to watch, um, it turns out they'll, they'll all blink in a synchronized way at particular points in time. Um, this is a research by a Japanese group, and they showed that if Mr. Bean is, is driving along while, as he does, trying to put his shirt on, people will blink in unison when he's gotten both of his hands into the sleeves. Now, that's just something we do with our eyes to edit the events and uh, create their boundaries. It turns out that there's a system in the brain that is devoted to this. Um, a different group of researchers from America showed people video clips of mundane, everyday events and had them uh, um, say where the boundaries between different things was. For example, a woman is taking a saxophone out of a box and now she's finished doing so. 
And then they, they gave these strips to other people, and they looked to see what happens in their brain when they put them in an MRI scanner. And it turns out there are areas of the brain that become active um, during the boundaries between events. So the events themselves flow. They, 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 there is no obvious stopping point in time. Life does not stop. Life doesn't have event boundaries. But we, through our brain activity, do impose those on the events in the world outside. So, from this we might get to thinking, okay, what is the most uh, common form of visual storytelling that we have nowadays? Um, when people watch films, what are they doing? What, what, how are they interpreting the narrative and, and what's happening in their brain as they do so? And what can that tell us about the experience of film watching? Uh, in this context, my, my uh, um, favorite uh, uh, research at the moment is coming out of the lab of someone named Gloria Hassan at Princeton University. And his basic idea is this. When you watch a film, the film is a way of trying to impose the same brain state on everyone in the audience. So what Gloria Hassan did uh, originally in his very first study was he showed people uh, clips of the movie The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly uh, while they lay in an MRI scanner. And he watched to see what happened in their brains. They wasn't that interested necessarily in uh, which areas of the brain were more active or less active. What he wanted to see was, would the film create the same brain activity in everyone? And here's roughly what he found. This is brain activity in the same brain area in five different people. Now, as you can see, the five lines are not identical, but they're pretty similar. And, and what he found was a high degree of intersubject correlation. Uh, people's brains did more or less the same thing, went up and down in unison as they watched the same movie. And it wasn't limited just to visual areas of the brain. It happened all over the brain. Um, for lack of time, I'll, I'll skip this slide, but the basic idea was, um, if you show people different movies, you can actually gauge how effective a movie is at doing this. So Alfred Hitchcock, a uh, very effective director, knew exactly how to manipulate his audience's emotions and feelings and expectations. When you watch a Hitchcock film, as much as 70% of your cortex uh, that's the outer layer of the brain that does hold a high-level thinking. we we'll react the same way across different people. For Sergio Leone, the director of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, still pretty effective, but a bit less so. If you have the kind of comedy that not everyone gets, like the Larry David show, uh, you'll still get some correlation across some of the brain. But if you show people just a segment of reality, just a camera on the street, and people watch exactly the same thing, this will not evoke the same brain activity, because it's devoid of narrative. It's devoid of events that people are actually interested in, and people go off and think their own thoughts in, respond to what, in response to what they're seeing. We still see correlations in very, very early visual areas of the brain, areas that just respond to the incoming visual input. But none of the elaboration in higher level areas uh, that's so effectively manipulated, for example, by Hitchcock. Um, I'll skip this one for time as well. So the last um, type of narrative I want to talk about is possibly the simplest. There's um, a, a reviving uh, scene of just old-fashioned storytelling all over the world right now. Um, people just standing on stage um, with a microphone and telling a story from their lives. Uh, it's the, possibly the oldest form and most effective form of culture. This is Jim O'Grady. He's uh, very famous in New York for, for being a master storyteller. Um, when people were put in an MRI scanner and listened to a Jim O'Grady story, they showed massive correlations in their brain activity uh, across people. So here we have the brain activity of 11 different people. And this isn't where there was a lot of activity. This is how much of the brain responded in exactly the same way when they listen to the same story. And you can see it's, it's quite a lot. There's more than that, though. We can talk not only about the correlation between people listening to a story, we can talk about the correlation between someone telling a story and another person listening to it. It turns out that if you follow the brain activity of a person who's telling a story and remembering events from their lives and putting them into words, and you compare that to the brain activity of someone who listens to the story, you get very similar patterns of brain activity. In a very real sense, you could say that the purpose of telling a story is to put the listener into the same brain state as yourself. And it gets more interesting than that, because it turns out that there are different time frames for this. 
So there are areas of the brain that are active in the same way at the same time. Those just have to do with, with hearing, with the actual auditory interpretation of what's going on. There are other areas that respond in the listener and have the same pattern as the speaker's brain activity, but a few seconds later. That has to do with interpretation. But most interestingly, in frontal areas of the brain, areas that have to do with planning and attention, you actually get activity that mimics, activity in the listener, that mimics the activity of the storyteller, but happens a couple of seconds before the storyteller has the same activity. What this shows is that we spend a lot of our time when we're listening to other people actively trying to predict what they're going to say. And in fact, the people who had a higher level of correlation that was anticipatory were better later on when tested at remembering the story that they heard. Meaning that if you successfully do this, if you're able to anticipate what the person is going to say, you'll understand what they're saying better and you'll be better able to relate to it and you'll remember it better. Okay, so telling stories is essentially turning someone else's brain into your brain. Uh, but it's a lot less sinister than it sounds. We, we do it all the time, we do it naturally. You could argue it's part of what makes us human and successful social interactors. The last thing I want to talk about is, until now I've been talking about the science of storytelling. How, as scientists, we interpret what happens in the brain while people listen to a story or tell a story. And how people tell themselves a story in their brains when they watch reality. The last bit is, I want to talk about is, is an inversion of that, how we can use stories um, in science and in any other domain. As human beings, we are particularly um, hardwired to be interested in stories and in storytelling. Uh, as a scientist, I know that whenever I write a scientific report, a paper about my own results, part of what's important to me is to tell a good story, to grip the readers and convince them. Um, it goes beyond just scientific reporting, though. Um, I mentioned before that there's a, a, a revival of storytelling as, as a cultural event. Uh, there, are, um, there are various events around the world that are devoted nowadays to science storytelling. In particular, there's, there's a series that takes place in New York, and they've started holding events in London as well called the Story Collider, where people tell stories either about their scientific experiences in life uh, as scientists, or um, just tell stories, if they're not scientists, uh, about how science has touched their lives and played a role in their lives. I, I told a story there myself. Um, you can actually listen to it as a podcast. But this isn't to plug my own story. What it really is intended to plug is the Story Collider itself. I really recommend going on their website and listening to their podcast. There's a new story there every week, and it's a fascinating way to learn more about science and scientists' lives. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Um, James has been thinking about interactive media for some time, and I'd like to ask James to tell us more about how he thinks interactivity uh, kind of complicates the art of storytelling. Okay. Hello? Hi, so I'm a lecturer here at the university. I teach the um, graphic communication program and I'm also a designer and design uh, mostly for the web and mobile devices. And what I'm really interested in is how um, the crafting of the interface in some of those forms, um, if it's done particularly well, that allows us to intuitively grasp what it is we're supposed to do and, and allows us to get absorbed in the activity of, of interacting with that particular piece of content. And when it's done badly, um, that can create an experience which is quite um, you know, possibly frustrating or disruptive um, and perhaps presents obstacles to that experience. And in relation to storytelling, Increasingly, we're experiencing stories um, via interactive means. So, as, as has already been explained in the past, um, you know, originally we would have um, gained stories through oral means, through um, you know, a storyteller. 
recounting something um, in a verbal way to a group. Um, then obviously we've, through n numerous centuries, um, experienced stories um, from, from a written form on, on a printed page or something like that. Yet in the last sort of few decades, um, we're now able to experience stories in different means, either through, through the web or an interactive form. And um, that poses certain sort of um, challenges, perhaps. So I'd like to argue that the design of some of these experiences, um, which are becoming more prominent and, and, and more kind of pervasive in many ways, um, aren't properly considered in, in many examples. And that might be problematic. Um, as David has elucidated very well, um, a lot of studies, um, brain imaging studies, have, have shown that, um, or have perhaps suggested that one of the reasons why um, storytelling is, is hardwired and our, our, our kind of desire to um, gain information in this way is it, something that's kind of very intrinsic to who, who we are as, as human beings. Um, might possibly be to do with the fact that um, when we read a bit of text or we hear something that someone's telling to us, um, not only is the part of our brain that deals with the processing of language activated, all the parts of the brain that are to do with um, whatever's happening in that fictional scenario are, are becoming engaged and active in that process as well. So if a piece of writing is talking about a particular texture or smell, that part of our brains that deal with those things um, are, are lighting up, they're activated, um, and we're effectively sort of projecting ourselves into that scenario, and, and our brain is kind of almost sort of going through the same motions as if we were really in that situation. And so that perhaps suggests, you know, one of the reasons why, why storytelling is, is quite an important and, and effective way of getting across information and um, because of that it maybe allows us to remember things more clearly um, it allows us to understand things better and so if we're beginning to experience storytelling in, in these interactive ways um, and that um, is maybe possibly in some cases becoming a kind of more fragmentary um, or more kind of um, complex sort of um, experience, then, then you know, maybe the way that we've, we share information, we communicate information to each other is, is you know, being challenged. So to, to illustrate this point, here's an example of a, um, a, a sort of section of a web um, page from the New York Times. So um, over the last sort of year or so, a, a new kind of form of, of um, long form editorial has been developed. Um, websites in the past quite often would sort of break up um, either stories or you know, pieces of journalistic writing into kind of just a, a straight page which you might scroll through. Uh, different articles might sort of be on different pages that you click between. Um, but recently, um, people have sort of realised that maybe you can kind of tell a much more complex, um, longer piece of um, narrative by having a very kind of tall, sort of scrollable um, page, which as you go through it, um, sort of triggers off various different sort of interactive events. So what happens in this uh, particular article, which focuses on um, an avalanche that happened um, in a skiing resort um, near Seattle, uh, where a lot of people were sort of um, caught up in this, this you know, quite terrible event. Um, the article focuses on interviewing the people that it happened to. You start off by reading the text um, as you would do in a normal sort of, you know, kind of uh, either web page or printed form, and you know you're asked to sort of engage with the story in, 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 on that level, and then sort of very very quickly as you move down, um, you suddenly encounter various other kind of types of um, information presented to you in different ways. So uh, this is a still, but what happens when you reach the, this section here is that. Um, suddenly you're, you're presented with an animated fly-through of the, um, the mountain range where, where this happened. And then as you scroll through various other sort of clips um, you're asked to engage with, here you have a slideshow that you're asked to kind of move off and, and, and run through. And 
you know, I, I would argue this is a kind of problematic um, way of presenting information because you're being asked, or at least the, the reader, the viewer, is being asked to switch between various different kind of methods of um, not only sort of um, engaging with the information, but also um, performing different kind of um, you know physical movements in order to sort of um, you know activate various areas of the screen. We're having to kind of learn a new uh, maybe kind of method and understand what that sort of icon with the, the squares in it might mean to us. Um, so there's a lot of things going on there which, which it's asking us to do. Um, and you know, I, I would argue that that sort of disrupts our engagement with the story. That means that we have to kind of step out of it in order to kind of access these, these other methods. Um, and therefore, you know, that, that causes um, um, various sort of problems. I can give lots of other examples in different forms of, of where this is apparent. So there's a whole range of um, iPad apps that are sort of designed for children, uh, which essentially illustrate children's books, um, but where the, the, the child is asked to kind of interact with the characters as they go through. And there's so many things happening there, really. Um, as you know, they turn a page, a virtual page, they're asked to maybe kind of prod and, and kind of you know press buttons and sounds are made. And um, once again, that's asking us to step out of the um, story itself and, and, and do some sort of other activity. So, I, um, you know, I'm kind of interested in that, obviously, as, as a kind of phenomenon, but what I've been doing, I've been working with a researcher called Emma Whitaker to produce a series of um, interactive narrative apps. Um, this one on the screen here, or the representation of it, um, is currently uh, available and, and you can play it in the museum, Prince Museum across the road. Um, and I can you know, put a link up to it if you're interested at the end. Um, but essentially, um, it's an oral based experience and it's asking you to um, move through a particular narrative that is an interactive narrative and you can choose different paths through it. Uh, but it's asking you to do it uh, by moving about physically rather than having to kind of step out of um, a particular kind of form um, in order to make that choice. So we were really interested in trying to integrate the interaction within the story world itself. Um, we've done it through um, basically kind of using these clever little things called eye beacons, which um, a little kind of radio transmitters that the phone can detect as you move around the space. So the um, the app you listen to it on headphones, and um, you you play it on a smartphone. And as you move around, um, it can detect where you are, and the oral story um, as you move around the space will adapt and change, but in a sort of very intuitive and seamless way. So it's not that you enter a room and suddenly you're kind of presented with a, a new thing. It sort of um, mixes and, and blends in and out. Um, in terms of the graphic element on the screen, um, the phone becomes a, a kind of prop within the narrative itself. So the phone is transformed into this magic device that allows you to sort of hunt down various objects within the museum. And it's, that's the kind of purpose of the, the story, is to kind of locate these particular objects in order to sort of um, achieve a certain goal. Um, you get phone calls from characters, um, and so the, the visual element is, is kind of synchronised with what you're listening to. And um, also, in order to provide feedback on the screen, um, as you're kind of collecting things and being given information, that there is stuff there on the screen, but it's quite subtle, uh, and it doesn't pop up or sort of try and detract from, from what you're doing. It's kind of sitting there in the background, and the majority of the experience is an oral one. Um, so that's all I've got to say, really. Um, um, there's lots of other kind of you know, possibilities here, and I think that the main point I'm trying to make really is that um, quite often the design of, of some of these forms, we, we've got a lot of opportunities and a lot of exciting sort of possibilities with, with kind of what technology is offering us, but unless the way that um, 
you interact with that content as, as considered and designed, um, then the way that stories are told and the way that we engage with stories could possibly be you know, under threat in some way. Okay, thank you. Thanks, James. I'd like to ask Henry to uh, give us some ideas of how stories and games relate to each other and what exactly is a mega game? <laughs> okay, so hi. Um, so um, I've got a slightly low-tech approach to this, um, but hopefully still hi-fi. Um, So, um, 18 months ago, I started a board game publishing company down in Cornwall, because um, you do. And um, uh, so now my life is all about games. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is how games and storytelling, I think, are actually roughly the same thing. And to talk about where they are now, and possibly where they're going in the future. So, um, over the last 20 years, we've seen a really, really radical revolution um, in, uh, in game design. Um, in terms of what's going to be made. So games now are smarter, uh, they're better designed, uh, they're more holistic, um, and they're more engaging. Um, from a commercial side, which is kind of where I have to look at things now, um, the, uh, the, the demographics, people who are actually engaged in games, is getting bigger and bigger um, as, um, I don't know why I'm talking about that, um, as, <laughs> as um, more people engage in this. And this is kind of driven from a technological point of view. Um, technology is making games more accessible, um, so it's kind of natural that we'll see them more in our lives. Um, there's a dystopia associated with this, um, which you might have seen through uh, Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror, um, season two. There's um, one where one guy's life is basically ruled by games, the whole society is ruled by games. But um, in terms of kind of what we've seen, um, games are a, a shared language which we all have. Um, it doesn't work in every country, but it does in England, certainly. Um, so we all know Monopoly, uh, we all know Risk, we all know Cluedo. Monopoly is 83 years old, um, Cluedo's um, 66 years old, Risk, I don't know, about 54 years old. Um, over the last 20 years, um, everything has changed. So we've, um, it's insane that we kind of have a, a field um, that wouldn't advance at all, like say biology. Imagine all the amazing things that happened in biology and chemistry um, over this time. And this is kind of what's happened with games. So. We have um, not just in terms of role-playing games or um, German Euro-style board games, um, but we have games which are used for marketing primarily now. So we have club cards, and we all play a game to collect kind of points and get more money. Um, it's unusual to kind of think about the film being released now without having some kind of app game associated with it, um, and that's kind of where we're at at the moment, I think. Um, I see games as a medium for interaction. That's all they are. Um, it's not just with the game itself, um, but it's with the, the questions, the ideas uh, that are contained within the game, and most importantly, it's with the players. Um, whether it's playing uh, something cooperatively, or competitively, or maybe even deterministically, um, it's no doubt this is a shared experience, and this is basically what I see storytelling as. Um, there's lots of reasons why people play games, um, and while I deal with the commercial side of it, um, it's uh, from, a, from a personal point of view, I've been making games for the last 16 years. Um, board games are quite new to me, about three years. Before then, it was all what I would call the mega game, which I think that's probably the most idiopathic name for it. Um, it's something which is um, half a board game, half a, half a role-playing game, and half a theatre. Um, we see examples through this. Um, it's something which is essentially for around about 12 to 50 uh, people. You can go larger, but it doesn't really work as well. Um, and the idea of this as the almost the quintessential expression of a, uh, a collective narrative which has been created um, by the players is what it is. It's something which is, um, is defined in certain ways. So you need to have rules. You need to know how, how the game works, what kind of rules you can operate in. So this might be something um, in terms of um, doing papers as a stone uh, with someone when you need to do like a fight with them or something. Or it might be something in terms of trying to um, uh, unpuzzle a, a three-dimensional kind of um, uh, one of those metal puzzles. I don't know if you guys have seen those. Um, Victorian type thing. Um, it might be something like that, which you'll have to do as an analogue for maybe fixing an engine. Um, 
but the, there do need to be rules which are associated with it. The um, other things we have, um, the kind of a, the key thing is actually having some kind of negotiation. So something that you don't have within yourself, you don't have all the information, you need to talk to someone else, you need to kind of figure it out from them. Um, and you need to negotiate for that, it's not just given to you. Um, sorry, say again? Okay, no, I don't know pitch, that's fine. Okay. Um, right, okay. Um, also, uh, this needs to happen face to face, and this is kind of the main thing, I think, um, that I wanted to really talk about. Um, the way that we communicate with each other isn't just vocal, it's um, also physical and um, a whole load of other things that are going with it. Um, the semi optically, I mean, look at me, what I'm dressed with, how I'm spoken, the, ten the tone of my voice, um, and the, my kind of body language that I'm using. Um, these are all ways that I'm communicating with you guys right now. Um, what computer games do really well is they immerse people really nicely um, and really strongly, but the communication that you get with people is still quite limited. Um, headsets, avatars, all these kind of things help with this, um, but it's still not enough, and it's still not where we're at right now. Um, what um, pen and paper games do really well, and why they're kind of still really quite successful, um, is because the way you're interacting with people isn't about the game you're playing, it's about how you're interacting with other people over this game and using that as a medium. Um, in terms of where I feel that games are actually going to be going, um, is uh, more in the sense of this kind of collective kind of uh, storytelling experience. Um, because it's not, it's not that the, um, how do I say this? So it's not that there's a, a pre-planned kind of railroaded kind of storyline that you're going down through. You're given a starting point and you're given some points along the way, but the way it all ends up is something which everyone decides together. But they're not deciding it over a committee or anything like that, they're deciding it through playing the game. And I think this is what we'll see. What technology is giving us is the ability to access this um, much more easily. So it's making the, um, the way we're engaging with it um, uh, a lot more streamlined. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. There you go. <laughs>
Geiger wrote all of them. And it turns into quite an, an adventure. And he gave audiences, uh, during this show, he gave audiences the option to choose which of several options to, to go down. Uh, all the things that he had done, he, 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 there wasn't time to put them all in one show. So every show was a bit different. Uh, and, and he gave people clickers to vote. Um, and I remember thinking, this, this could be a fantastic research tool on things like what affects people's decisions on which way to go and what they find more interesting. And I even discussed it a bit with him, but we haven't done anything about it. <laughs> I think it would be a great thing to do in the future. Would you like to comment on the question? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I got a little bit distracted, so yeah. So it's really about the fact that you, the readers, you want to now choose mm. outcomes and so on. How does that affect the subjectivity of the two storytellers? Well, the yeah, cool. Okay, so I think this is kind of the adventure that we're going to find out, really. So the, it has been nonlinear interaction. It's more interesting. Um, uh, you were talking about the, the golden hair. Um, which is uh, an adventure which happened, um, which is in Cornwall actually, um, where someone wrote a book and they buried a golden, a, a gold, actual gold hair um, somewhere in Cornwall. And you kind of read the book and you went through it and you had to find out where the hair was. Um, the, in terms of kind of being able to tie things together, I think this is a technological thing. Um, I don't think it needs to be a game design thing because there becomes a point where I've, uh, I've run games before for my largest is about 3,500 people. And what you find is you have to dilute and dilute and dilute everything that you're doing to the point where it isn't really a game. There's no choice kind of associated with it. It's just kind of chasing things. And that's not really what a game is. Um, so I think at the point, um, at right now, there's a certain place you can take this and a certain number of people you can take it to. Um, but past that, um, I think the rest of that will come with technology. Uh, yeah, so some of the stuff that I've been working with is, is kind of non-linear, and there's there's lots of different models for um, like how you structure um, the sort of content, and so you can have a kind of what's called a branching path model, which sort of starts in one point, and you have you know a choice, and then it goes off, and then branches off again a bit like a tree, um, and then you can have other models that are sort of more um, what are called node-based, which um, mean that um, the, the story can essentially be kind of like experienced in all sorts of different orders um, and sort of quite abstract connections between different chunks are made. Um, in answer to your question, um, I think it sort of depends on how the story is delivered. And I suppose one of the, some of the things that I'm particularly interested in are in relation to you know how, how that point where you are asked to choose is... Um, communicated I suppose and, and how the reader is, is asked to kind of enact that choice and if it's done in a way where you're very conscious of the fact that you're doing that then that becomes a very different experience to one where maybe um, that choice is just sort of happening um, amongst the activity that you're doing whilst you're interacting or, or reading um, Per se, so those choose your own adventure books that I mentioned before. You know, part of the sort of appeal of those is the fact that you, it wasn't just a kind of straightforward book. It, it was this other type of activity, and you, you know, read a bit, and then you got to kind of roll the dice, or you know, sort of, um, you know, make a choice and, and write stuff down on the page at the back and things like that. Um, so it it becomes less about synchronicity and more about sort of um, your activity that you're taking forward. Um, but I think one of the things that digital media can do is is maybe allow you to sort of make those choices without even perhaps knowing that you're doing them. Um, and I think that's where where synchronicity might be able to be maintained. Right, that's what you wanted to say. Should we take another question? Yeah, I would, I would second what uh, James just said. Um, that the, there's a distinction between um, an author or a playwright uh, that, that wants you to uh, experience something which the person prepares for you 
and there's a relationship between the author and the audience. And on the other hand, a game designer, which might want you not to put you into a situation where you just experience uh, pre-made things, but to discover, to, uh, to explore, and to build your own things. So the role of a game designer or somebody who prepares a playful experience is, is maybe more to give you toys, to give you the means um, to do something actively, to, to uh, be within a world, within an environment. So it's more like providing the possibility for an experience um, and that's where, where uh, game design and, and the other arts often, um, it, it's an interesting field, but it's a field of, of a certain tension between these, these arts. Hi. Well, good, good evening, everyone. Um, well, may, may I wonder, as I can get the, the games, if there is actually trading turn yourselves into whatever sort of thing they want to be, then you could have the other end of the game. Well, you should have seen a virtual, a virtual world where they actually make money. Second life? Oh, yeah. Second life? Yeah. So I'd like to um, ask the questions of what one would you call on that situation. So I think the second life is, is the thing of, um, it's an approximation to um, having a better way to interact, basically. So do you mean, is your question more about kind of how you're creating an economy around game? Or, um, so I think kind of with most, with most games now, especially with kind of most kind of massive multiplayer online games, um, there's a, a market which is kind of associated behind it. So you can see this with E, you can see it with Warcraft. Um, you saw it even like with EverQuest back in like 2004, um, these things which kind of exist. And you'll get it with, even with modern games which aren't necessarily massive multiplayer. Um, it's like Call of Duty games, you'll have people trading characters um, and working in that way. I think it's just another currency. Really. I'll just add a. Just a quick thing to add to that. I think um, massive online role-playing games are, are a fantastic opportunity because they, for, for, for research and also for experience uh, for players, because they enable us to put people into a situation that they invest a lot of time and effort and often money in um, that is different from our real world and which we can manipulate to meet certain requirements that are different. For, so for example, I think in, in Second Life everyone can fly. I've never played it, but uh, I'm fairly certain. Now that, that, you know, if you are immersed in that world for long enough, that will change some of your perspective on life. Uh, and there could be some very interesting insights uh, on things that we could never ethically or physically manipulate and research in the real world that we could do in games and reach some very interesting conclusions about human nature. May I, may I comment on that? I'll be very brief. I do not have a television. I do not have a computer. I have old gold radios, and I try and flip down the local and catch up on some sort of visual news. But Arthur Watson reads me, because I, I live in a library, basically, so my point is I enjoy reading, well, Arthur reads me, kindly reads me books, and I, I think one's imagination, I think it's much more fun, and you can interact with what's going on now, drive Arthur up the wall most of the time, but... Okay, you know, we're going to take another question over there, yes. thanks. Well, thank you anyway, it's a very valid point, and thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, storytelling is fascinating, and storytelling tales, transmission, it's, I mean, how people shared images and converged into tales like Snow White and everything. Seems like today, the storytelling is somehow slightly, I mean, well, there are more people sharing at the same time, it seems much more selfish and more like individual rather than just sharing a common story in a way. So how, I mean, it's a massive change, a switch between transmitting stories by the fire to playing in front of our computers, sometimes playing together, but not so much together actually in real life, in, in truth. 
Yeah, sure. So, I don't know, I kind of think you're kind of right in that. I mean, there's a thing with games in terms of the actual kind of um, kind of chemical effects and psychological effects about having them. Um, but I think kind of the question is, the thing is more about it can't, everyone can't be playing the same story. Otherwise, it's boring. You've just gone online and you find out how does it all end. You need to kind of create the story yourself. You need to experience the story yourself. This is kind of what the computer, uh, this is what computer games are doing in the way that they're very, very immersive because you're immersed in the story and you're working that way. I would say, I'm not really that surprised to hear you say that. I've never really thought about it before. But yeah. Um, there could be an argument that uh, ever since the um, novel came along, then you know, story reading stories has, has maybe become quite a sort of internal individual <coughs> activity. Um, you know, you could kind of throw that one back. Um, and then also, you know, fairly recently there's there's been this um, sort of um, not not a craze but a, a kind of movement for um, sort of social television watching where um, you know sort of um, groups of friends would use social media to so whilst they're watching a you know Coronation Street or something like that they're, they're communicating with each other. Um, and commenting sort of constantly throughout the, the live transmission of that program. So I think um, it's, it's probably not to a kind of particular platform medium. I think it's just that as, as human beings, we probably like to do things together sometimes, and sometimes we like a bit of peace and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> So, so to just pick up on the on the historical point, there's there's an interesting trade-off throughout history between uh, the audience, the size of the audience, and the experience of the person experiencing the story. So, so storytelling started out um, as I, as I talked about earlier, um, as you know, a tribal thing, people uh, sitting around the fireplace at the fire, and, and one person telling a story, and it was it was a communal activity, um, and it was part of the. It, uh, um, the, the group identity was partly formed by the stories that are told and listened to. Now, w once we had print, uh, experiencing story became a much pro more private sort of thing, uh, even though you could reach a much, much larger, audi larger audience. And, and today I think we're seeing a very interesting thing where you can reach an even larger audience through uh, uh, electronic means, and we're getting back to the social aspect because people share so much of their experience. I'd say that if I was to synthesise what's been said here today, and also Michael's game, that there's a sort of a neural aesthetic of storytelling, where you've got things that you want them to be quite predictable, so that the narrator can brainwash the audience, but simultaneously you want them to be unpredictable enough, gamified enough, that you're continuously alive during that experience. So, there's a, I think if you were to statistically analyse humans, you'd be able to sort of zero in on, um, say, what's the 95% most successful game you can get in terms of that tension between predictable and unpredictable. I would suggest that that leads to a very normative game where you get the, the story or the game that appeals to the most people. And we sort of see this in many media. And so I was wondering what your, your feelings about the, the one game to rule them all is. <laughs> would you pay for that statistical analysis? I feel the mic's impossible to me. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, like, it's folks and strokes, isn't it? It doesn't work like that. Um, you've got things that sell the most, of course. That'd be the normative game, um, and it'll appeal to most. But what we're seeing, I mean, especially with the, the self-publication kind of revolution that's happened over the last five years, um, you're seeing a lot more diversity and a lot more creativity, which is getting through, because um, games aren't being published just purely for commercial root means. They're being published because people just want to make them. Um, yeah, I think so. And yeah, and there is a market for that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would also uh, speak for, for diversity instead of the, the one game to rule them all idea. But if you, if you can make it, you're going to be very successful. So <laughs> So the idea that you can analyse what people really want by statistical means is, is not, it's not new. But the problem is it doesn't work. Uh, just look at, you know, Hollywood movie studios have been trying to find the formula for a blockbuster for, for decades. 
and sometimes it works and sometimes it falls on its face in a massive multi-million dollar loss. I'm sorry, I'm just a visitor in Plymouth from Edinburgh and I couldn't resist asking you a question because I recently took part um, in a, a project at Edinburgh University for elderly people and how they would uh, like to have a, 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 a home environment plan for them and that, and that was followed by uh, an invitation to put on headphones and take part in a project in which we walk through two eco ecosystems, one rural and one city, to see how our emotions would show up on the in the brain. Okay, so it just draws me listening to this tonight. I was just wondering how much emotional um, use you made in making your games and so on. How much you took into account the different types of emotions that, that, that people gave off, as it were, in, in receiving different information. I'm not making some sense. <laughs> okay, so again, I think this is me. Um, the experience the player gets is kind of essential. So when, it's, when you're winning, um, it's got, it feels amazing, but when, it's, when you're losing, it feels quite sharp. And you need to kind of be minimising that. With the games that we're making, what we tried to do was, um, so I recognised there was a real flatness in, in the games market, um, not just in terms of the way the games look, but also in terms of the way the games engage with the audience. Um, so um, I said about making heavily thematic games, so games where you're, they're either about real things, real places, obviously it's abstract because it's a board game, but um, uh, the idea is that you're kind of sinking yourself into it as much as possible. In fact, you have a choice about how much you want to go into it. This is something which has been modelled, which we're seeing in the uh, with the game with the board games industry certainly. And I don't really know about other markets so much, um, but we're seeing uh, games which are um, more intricately designed um, and they're um, being made to be more thematic, more immersive in a sense. So I mean, this is a, this is a great thing for me because I kind of feel like I'm on the right track. Um, but um, in terms of, kind of as a whole, I would say this is a movement that's happening already. So, um, yeah, kind of measuring emotion is quite a tricky thing to do. Um, but, um, I, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm a designer. And when we put our apps together, what we do is we user test them. So we get groups of people to try them out, and then we observe how they get on. And then we ask some questions at the end and, and sort of try and ascertain from, from those questions um, whether what we're trying to do is successful or not. And um, the... The app that I showed up on the screen um, is, is kind of geared towards teenagers, really. It's got kind of quite a specific group. And um, what we did was um, we, we found that um, they sort of seem to respond to being kind of put under a lot of pressure. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the app itself um, has a time limit to it. So they've got their kind of, kind of got, got the pressure of sort of having to be able to sort of do something with a particular time. And then um, also, the way that the sound is designed is it, it gets more and more kind of jarring and unpleasant as the uh, game goes on. And, and yeah, so what we found through sort of user testing is that actually that kind of made them a, a, a lot more excited, um, at least. So that's one notion. Um, and more sort of enthusiastic to try it again when they fail. And, um, and yeah, generally seem to respond better to doing things in that way. So um, that's, that's how we did it. Try to make it very quick. Uh, my question is actually related to what Claire, the young lady here in the front, said before. Um, stories, no matter whether you tell them over the fire or you read them or you watch a movie, um, they try to, I think it has been mentioned, establish one maybe normative interpretation of, of an event. So stories have a morale, right? We would say, the, mora the morale of the story. Um, now you're telling me in games, um, you give people choices so people can kind of create different morales. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have these very elaborate background stories, smugglers in Cornwall, I don't know, some sorts of uh, war settings, whatever game, I'm not a gamer, obviously. So um, 
Is that a difference? Do games not have a morale, or is, 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 is there still some similarities with the stories that, that we tell each other? Okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, two different things. So in terms of the, the, the board games and the mega games that she was talking about, um, with the kind of blurring between the technological side of things and working that way. There is, a, there is a, uh, in board games it's less about the moral kind of compass, um, but you have a choice about that. And you certainly can see a lot of games which are designed like Dead of Winter, um, which is out this year, which is a, a zombie survival co-op, um, is precisely made about that. Um, the idea being, um, how do you define your humanity? after the apocalypse, the inevitable apocalypse, sorry. Um, so, how, yeah, how do you do that? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, and it's something which isn't really kind of um, ideally addressed. Um, in terms of the, um, where I think games are going to be going, um, I think this is something which is much more interesting, and um, something which we'll see a lot more of. Um, it's essential, you have to have a choice. Right, well, we've reached the end of the evening. I thought I'd just add a... Yeah. A short comment on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you say only applies to games and not to books and films and stories. Um, so, so I talked a lot about successful films being able to create synchronicity amongst brains, but actually many of what we think of as the most successful um, films and stories, uh, successful in an artistic sense, not necessarily a commercial sense, are the ones that are a bit more open-ended, a bit more open to interpretation, where everyone can take from it what they want, maybe see it differently the next time they see it, or, or read it. Um, and, and it might be that those won't become the best-sellers or the blockbusters, but we think they're an achievement in their own right. Well, thanks everybody. And um, to, this evening's Cog Talk came to you as part of the Plymouth International Book Festival, which is still running. So if you want to have a look at the programme outside. You still have time to try out some other events. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers, David, Henry, James, and Michael for Neurotic. And thank you to you, the audience, for your participation in what's been a very enjoyable and stimulating evening. Thank you. Bye. Um, the next pop talk is December the 4th, and we're going to have Tim Knowles, who's an artist exhibiting at the Walk On Exhibition. He's going to come and talk about um, a sort of a spatial interaction with urban architecture, and we're going to have um, some people from the School of Architecture coming as well to talk about that. So um, I hope to see you all there. And uh, Sir Andrew Motion is um, the book festival get, uh, speaker tomorrow. So um, yeah, if you can, do come and see him, because I think that would be amazing as well. Thank you.